Hello, it's great to see you all here. This is the first of our lecture series here at uh, the Northern Ireland War Memorial. Tonight we'll be looking at uh, the American presence in Northern Ireland and a lecture titled Still Over Here, the Archaeology of the United States Military in Northern Ireland. Essentially we'll be looking at what they built, where they built it and what remained. So let's get cracking here. Right now, at the outbreak of the war in September 1939 plunged Europe into what would become the most devastating and costly conflict in human history. As the Wehrmacht marched from one victory to another, it appeared like nothing could check the advance of Nazi Germany. Now, this appeared apparent never more so than after the lightning advance in the West with Denmark, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and ultimately France, all capitulated the German onslaught in June 1940. The United Kingdom, supported by its overseas dominions, stood protected, for the time being, that is, by the English Channel. On the other side of the Atlantic, while there were many in the United States that wished the United States to stay out of the war, which was, which, in which they were ostensibly neutral, President Roosevelt instituted a series of programs to provide support for Britain. In September 1940 came the Destroyers for Bases Agreement, in which 50 mothballed U.S. Navy destroyers were transferred to the Royal Navy in exchange for land in U.K. territories, in which the U.S. would erect naval bases. Uh, and in December 1940, Roosevelt made his Arsenal for Democracy speech, uh, committing the United States to arm and support the United Kingdom and Canada in their war against Germany. And in March 1940, he had the Land Lease Act, which was signed providing the UK and its allies with food, fuel, and material in return for leases again on bases and, and ultimately ending US neutrality. Now, the US massively expanded its military forces during this period though Benny still wished for the U.S. to avoid direct involvement in the war. And this became a moot point when, as you can see in that bottom photograph, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941, and the subsequent declaration of war by Germany, by Germany on the United States. Now, though the U.S. officially entered the war, uh, at the end of 1941, the U.S. is sort of hedging its bets a lot. And in preparation for the ultimate involvement in the war, it was already here. Uh, we're talking about the, the summer of 1941. One of these places was in Lissa Halley on the River Foyle. Now, the problem was that the fall of France gave Germany access to the Atlantic ports along the French coast, forcing Allied convoys to take the more northerly approaches to the United Kingdom. Uh, this and the refusal of uh, the southern government uh, under De Valera to allow Britain to use the treaty ports at Loch Swilly made uh, Derry, London Derry, vitally important for the protection of the crucial. Uh, shipments coming across the Atlantic. So like I say, although the US was not officially in the war, uh, they had been sending huge supply, uh, shipments of supplies. Uh, but by this stage, by the summer of 1941, uh, they'd actually started sending uh, technicians. Now, we use technicians very loosely. Um, there were US Navy technicians uh, that were sent to start a building what would later become a US Naval Operating Base. Uh, on on the River Foyle. Now, uh, a hut, let's see what we can see. There's an image of it here. Now, what we can see is a hut camp was constructed at Beach Hill, and piling was begun in October for a, a thousand foot wharf at Lissa Halley. Uh, and what you can see here, uh, this is the wharf here that they built. And what you can also see here that later it was actually fully operational by the start of uh, soon into 1942, which is a bit quick considering they just start jumped into the war at the end of 41. And you can see here, there's the uh, US Navy wharf, the refueling jetty here. These are the storage sheds along this area here. Uh, and again, this is the hutted camp here uh, for the barracks. And then a 300,000 barrel uh, a gallon fuel farm just up here. So you can see there was an awful lot built. Uh, and so they were right to sort of get a jump on it by coming in uh, sort of before they were even in on um, And what we can see here is some of the US uh, uh, destroyers uh, um, berth at the wharf. Uh, and on the right hand side, they're here. You see, this is an extension to the wharf, and this was a refueling jetty that would allow uh, ships to sail down the foil and then refuel directly from here. From that would, fuel would be coming from the fuel farm. Uh, all these uh, sailors had to actually stay somewhere. Um, and in this case, we hear is Springtown, which was built on the west side of the foil. Uh, this is looking uh, from north to south, and this is the foil down here. And uh, this is a huge hutted camp uh, that was built in here. You can see the barracks. 
here and then the service and uh, administration buildings just along here. And it seems actually really quite strange, but all these lined along here are all air raid shelters. It does seem all built in air raid shelters in the foil since it was never attacked. But yeah, it was one of the key features, one but actually longer lasting features. Um, the, the camp would actually house about 1,300. It's 134 barracks and 14 nest huts. Uh, and strangely enough, then, even after the Americans left, this, uh, had, had, this camp had actually a much longer life as it was used by people to uh, supplementary housing. And there is actually one of the ones later on that there was um, the some of the early disputes over housing. And during the 1960s, it was actually because of people staying in this camp, because the council started charging people rent to live in these things. So there's people still living in these camp, this camp 21 years after the American sailors left. Um, of particular interest up around McGee College, you know the quite picturesque uh, administration building up there, is the US Navy built a fortified command control center in and around the grounds of McGee College. Uh, it was a combined Royal Navy and US Naval headquarters uh, at Talbot House, which also saw the construction of a massive concrete reinforced shelter and underground command control center. And what's really interesting about this one, there's this uh, ongoing uh, urban legend that this huge command control center actually remains underneath uh, the gardens. Uh, see these bushes in along here? The myth is that the, the bunker is still there. Other people have got to me to say, well, actually, it isn't. It's actually just the footings of the old administration building. But I like the other story anyway. We're not going to find out, but I like the other story. Um, state of it now, this uh, was, I was on field work in January of this year uh, for the Historic Environment Division. Uh, and I can just point out here, we can follow the cursor. Here's the old wharf here. And here's the old Royal Naval Jetty a wharf run down here. Most of the story sheds have all been removed with the new uh, Kilkira Power Station is here there. This is heavily overgrown, this section, but in all likelihood, there's possibilities of air raid shelters remaining there. And as you, yeah, it was a bit overgrown when I was there in the winter. <laughs> so I thought maybe some other hardy soul are going to get it. I was confident it's still in there. Maybe 10 years ago, but they could be gone by. I, th I think you're right. I think it's still there. Um, but there has been a load of sheds have actually been removed uh, in recent years. It's, the areas, it's prime industrial redevelopment area. Um, and there's one fuel tank there, which don't let it fuel fool you because it did fool me to think that it's actually part of the old fuel farm. It isn't. This is the old fuel farm. They demolished the tanks, and this was one put in after the war by the Royal Navy. And as you can see here, this is the wharf that was actually built by the US Naval Technicians when they weren't meant to be in the war. Uh, and the problem with it is, is it's uh, a wooden structure built in a lack of stream environment. It's wet and tidal. So nature will have it. Take its, take its toll on it. Um, also built were the wireless stations. There was two built, uh, one at Alton Galvin, just across from where the hospital is now. And this one is at Clooney. The one at Alton Galvin, see here, you see the antenna, um, was removed after the war. The one at Clooney actually remained open as a US Naval station up until 1978, 79, something like that. So the US Navy stayed for quite a while there. Also, um, you had the hospital at Creva. Uh, on the west side of the foil, and it consisted of wards with supporting facilities. Uh, our raid shelters were dispersed with the medical buildings, and the, the medical buildings, these are the wards over here, uh, and then you have the barracks and then stores and things like that. All, all these um, uh, wards were all uh, Quonset huts. Now, a Quonset hut looks like a Nissan hut, and to tell you the truth, I really can't quite tell the difference myself. They look very similar. Slight differences in construction, but let's, these are Quonset huts. Um, and then in, interspersed between every single one of the Nissan huts here were uh, sub, uh, semi submerged uh, air raid shelters. So we give um, shelter to patients and personnel. Uh, um, what it looks like now now, this was the commanding officer's uh, office. And I was told by people up there that the commanding officer didn't like the fact that his Nissan hut, sorry, Quantit hut, was too cold. And so we had a, a, a brick fireplace built into his office. Uh, and the, the concert hut is long since gone, but the brick fireplace still remains in the bushes up by the main house. Um, now, did, remember what I was actually telling you about the um, uh, area of the, the wards and the area shelters? Now, this, or this is that field now. And it's quite a chilly day that day, so I earned my money that day. Um, 
And I was chatting to the owner, and apparently all the footings of all those hut bases all actually remain there, just underneath the sod there. And this is actually quite a common way for these uh, remains to survive. Uh, Fincar Munition Store. Um, this was originally designed with 14 magazines called Armco Sheds after the company designed them. And the site was later expanded into 21 ammunition storage sheds. Now you can see there is the, the soldier, actually it's probably a, a Marine a garden a station there. I see the sheds that are coming into the glen. Now this is a part of the survey with HED and each one of those dots shows one of those structures and a few other sites. And it runs along the glen and they're cut into the side. And now the site stored munitions for the Naval, for the US Navy and the magazines are stored depth charges and torpedo warheads, naval shells and that sort of thing. Uh, and the, but the base was decommissioned in 1944. Of course, tell up the remains that actually stay in quite good condition to this day. This is actually one of those armco sheds here, sitting, uh, I think it's used as an agricultural shed now. Uh, and again, it's in quite good condition. This here is uh, an air raid shelter that was built, um, but they realized soon after they built it, they weren't going to need air raid shelters. And so they used it as a gunpowder store instead. Uh, and this odd looking hexagonal structure here, is uh, a light anti-aircraft uh, pit and it has these two ammunition lockers on either side this would have been built on the high ground overlooking the actual plan itself and uh, was designed to protect uh, the buildings inside it's actually a story in itself because the deeper you get into the glen the worse it gets and the further you go back the more overgrown it gets and so i think it must have took me about three hours to actually get from one end to the other to recording each one of these um, uh, sheds uh, and it's quite the adventure and what's worse actually when you got to the very end then I was faced with this um, and it just looks like a chain link fence but not all chain link fences are made equal when you think of chain link fence you think of something that you might behind a farmyard or, or out, uh, out in someone's garden these chain link fences were like uh, on steroids the, the, the chain link itself was very very sturdy the um, galvanized steel supports or something else and all the barbed wire is held in place with um, uh, like slats that actually slide down to, to secure. So it's, it's very hard to move. Uh, and then this hardy archaeology stroke historian had to end up climbing over one of these fences to get out of the place. Um, and I did it so you don't have to. Just take a photograph from the, from the bottom end. Can you see the drones inside one of those? Well, get to the drones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've not forgot the drones. <laughs> but we'll have the drones at the end. Okay, sorry. Okay, the Marines actually were up there. They were stationed at Beach Hill House. Um, there were two main camps at Beach Hill A and Beach Hill B, uh, and the security detachment of Marines were based there. Uh, of course, the officers stayed in Beach Hill House Hotel itself. Naturally, they're officers. Uh, one of the few remains that you can see upstanding is, again, one of the Quonset huts here. Um, but one of the things I did find that when I went further into, I don't know why they've actually explored. Anyone ever been up to Beach Hill? Mm -hmm. Fantastic that they've actually closed the hotel now. Okay. Uh, I think they have um, weddings there now, but the main house, I believe, is closed. Yeah. But that whole area over to the west, on the trees where people walk their dogs, uh, when I actually went looking, um, there's, there's a map there that shows you know, the, the hut bases, all where they were. And if you look closely, most of them are all still there. I couldn't find much at all. It's all just over. We're going to see the way that this, that uh, ranging road from the long there. Yeah. That's actually the edge of one of those hut bases. And you can see where it's been cut into the ground there. And it's all just been 70 years of overgrowth. It was all just covered over. But as far as I can see, most of it's all still there. OK, enough of the Marines in the Navy. What about the Army? Now, it's well known that um, the first US serviceman to set foot in Northern Ireland was uh, at the end of January 1942, was Private Milburn Henke, which actually you can see his badges here in the museum. Um, of the 34th Infantry Division, and he stepped off the ship, the Chateau Thierry. But as we already know, troops were already here. Uh, you had the ones up in Derry, and there was actually some getting combat experience in, in um, the iron. But during 1942, uh, the 34th Infantry Division, that's the Red Bull Division, uh, and the 1st Armoured Division were based in around Northern Ireland um, and around uh, South Down. Um, uh, the Red Bull Division actually more around sort of uh, central Northern Ireland and, uh, kind of, and even down as far as um, uh, Tynan. Um, however, by the end of the year, they left to take part in amphibious lands in North Africa as part of Operation Torch. Now, the second wave came at the end of 1943, when along with the Air Force uh, uh, and Naval personnel troops from 
the 2nd, 5th and 8th infantry divisions and the 82nd Airborne Division were stationed throughout Northern Ireland to train in preparation for the invasion of Europe. Now, the troops were stationed at scores of barrack sites across Northern Ireland and often with large, within wall, large domains, you know, the likes of Kelly Moon, Bally Edmund, all that sort of thing. Um, that's actually one of the things that uh, they just requisitioned. So you get a big house with lots of land. You had to have a very good excuse for it not to get requisitioned. I'm reliably informed one of the ways out of it was to have a girl's school on your land. Then you were, they would probably find some other use for it, but that would stop uh, troops being the station there. Um, today, actually, because of one, it's actually private land, and two, it covers such a large space. It's probably one of the least recognized um, facets of the American presence in Northern Ireland. And there's often little to be seen upstanding, but as you see in a minute, there's some still survive. Um, this is Bally Edmund House down by Carnaby Lock. Uh, this is home to the 5th Infantry Division in 1943. Um, and as you can see, it's extensive to say the least. You can see all the, the, the Nissen Huts, again, grouped uh, probably by a platoon and company. Uh, uh, and then a lot of all the administration buildings. And it was from here that they would have done exercises around the country. But then uh, if you see it now, there's almost nothing. Some of the actual roads survive, but even in uh, analysis of aerial photographs, uh, it's very difficult to see any upstanding remains or even subsurface remains. But if you go to somewhere like Ballywell Old House, now this is actually quite well known photograph showing US troops driving out of the gates. It's, uh, it was a uh, 1942, it was a camp for the 1st Armoured Division. Uh, and, but after they left, they then became a camp in 1943 for the 5th Medical Battalion and a quartermaster unit. And here you see the jeeps driving out. That's the same gate, even though the gatehouse seems to have lost its roof here. But once we went further into it, um, this is a photo our photograph of the dots shown where the hut bases still survive. Uh, here, here, and then there. And then this was actually a park for artillery stores. Uh, just here, it's just a large concrete hard stand. And then, as was my job at the time, I had to go investigate and then watch the bushes and find see which one of those purple dots are, or sorry, more marine, depending on your days. Um, you would have found uh, concrete hot bases, uh, and this is pretty much what those concrete hot bases remain. Ultimately, they're in this inner quantity. They're very easy to demolish because the curved structure is held together with tensioned wires. And so all I had to do to remove them is cut the, the wires and the tension was gone. They just collapsed, and then they went for scrap. That was the easy bit. The hard bit was to get rid of the concrete, so generally just left it. And that's why it survives today. Um, this one here is Gosford Castle. Let's get another one used for um, uh, British and American troops. And if you look closely here, you can see, see it. that's actually one of the better things. When he was looking at aerial photographs in the 1950s, after they demolished all the, you know, took away all the, the uh, sheeting for the, the Nissans or the Quonsets, they left all these concrete pods. That made it much, much easier to see them. And here you can see all the remains of the concrete uh, Nissan huts here. And actually many of these survive in Gosford Castle. And amongst the trees, uh, it's just again just years and years of leaf litter uh, has covered them over, but they still survive because this guy went out with a with a T shaped uh, probe to go poking for them, and they're all still there. Um, but even sometimes with some of the more innocuous uh, traces, uh, tell their own story. Here, actually, uh, this is some Gosford. This is one of the remaining uh, Quonset huts uh, on the other side there, from more the northern side of the hut, uh, on more the northern side of the uh, camp is a prefabricated water tower that would have serviced um, the troops there. But this sort of innocuous pass, would anyone else would just go, ah, it's just a concrete path that the farmers put there. This is it on the area photograph. And this was actually a path that ran up to the um, uh, a runway, uh, a grass runway that was used for uh, administrative flights um, by, by staff in Gosford Castle. And so once you actually realize what that was, if you look down, you can actually see a gap in the hedges just here. Where are we here? There we go. There's just a gap in the hedge there. And that's where that runway would have actually run through. So sometimes even the most innocuous things tell stories of. OK, now all these people were here for a reason. And that reason was for training. Uh, and so what we we'll have here is a plot uh, from the National Museum, from the British Museum, I believe. Um, and it's usually the firing ranges uh, that were sighted across now. And as you can guess, a lot of them are put in areas where there aren't people, such as the spires in the Morns, probably for good reason. Um, you can see the different colors are for Royal Artillery Range, an Armored Fighting Vehicle Range, an Armored Tank Range, a Field Firing Range, Battle Schools, the Aircraft Ranges, uh, a combined Royal Artillery and Field Firing Range and Mortar Ranges. There was lots of Mortar Ranges because you didn't need a lot of space. 
but apparently they're, they're, occasionally they don't go off and so they can turn up every now and again and they do turn up every now and again uh one of those ranges uh here we see is Dunseverick at the tank range up on the uh Antrim coast and here we can see here is uh trackways here for the range and here is uh, uh gun positions where they would have mounted the anti tank guns where people would be taught how to shoot uh, anti tank guns of course uh the enemy isn't going to sit still on a tank they like to shoot at them so what they actually had rigged up was you can see here see this straight line here they actually had a winding house just on the end here and that actually wound right along this gully here and actually towed a moving dolly that would have been a target roughly about the size uh a rectangular uh target that would have been the right size of a tank and it would be towed at tank driving speed and so they would have fired at the moving target so to make it realistic and of course this is one of the range block houses if you're actually an instructor sitting down range the last thing you want to be sitting out in the open so you they made sure that they were sitting in a very firm observation bunker uh here we have here yeah, the remains of the winding house and again since people are firing whoop oh, not the whack getting ahead of ourselves uh and since people are firing uh, armor piercing shells at you from relatively close range, the last thing you want to be is out in the open. So again, they've buried this in the ground. I'm not quite sure how a car got into the winding house, but there is very remains of a very, very, very old car. Um, but I don't think it's part of the winding house. What you have here is the remains of the winding house machinery here with the, the bearings. Uh, and then you would have the uh, winding gear where they went up through the hole in the roof. This is the remains of the gully that the target dolly would have been towed along. Um, and this is the, the uh, remains of, I would call it the uh, target range Mark One before they'd actually got as elaborate of the winding house. Uh, the story about this, it looks like a short runway, but the story goes uh, that they initially had the target wires for the dolly actually running down through pulleys and attached to the back and front of uh, a truck. And the truck drove along this track and as it, trolled, it pulled the wires and the dolly got towed. The problem was that while you're towing the dolly one way and it's going that way, there's people firing anti-tank shells over your head. So health and safety-wise, it's probably not a great idea and they're probably glad that they got a new system. Um, we also have um, small arms ranges. This is the Fee Carry range out near Tyrone. Uh, it's out in Tyrone, it's um, near Oma. Uh, um, and again, as you can imagine, troops are here to learn how to shoot. Uh, and this is an example, it's quite a good example of one of the ranges. Here you have uh, the remnants of, actually quite well preserved remnants of what's called the Markers Gallery. And it's like a concrete revetment. And this is where the targets would have been mounted and raised up um, behind this concrete environment. You would have had target markers that would have raised up the target. Uh, you would have fired out, they would have lowered down and they would have marked where you hit and then would have raised it up again and your instructors would have got the mark. Uh, and here you have here the target shed that sits at the end of that um, uh, Markers Gallery. And that's where they kept the spare target. In fact, if you actually go in there now, you can still see the frames of the targets that they used. This is actually one of the things I hadn't seen you expected. If you can guess what happens when you when you actually even hit your targets, it needs a backstop. They actually catch the bullets. Now there's been so many bullets fired down range that that part of the hill is entirely poisoned. It's still dead. There's so much lead. And there's so much copper that nothing grows. But something else, that's something I hadn't expected to find. It literally, it's, it's a piece of the landscape that's still blighted 70 years later, 80 years later. Um, not all of them are quite as extensive as that range. This is the Ballyutoga range. Um, anyone from it, even from Belfast, might even not know where Ballyutoga is. It's up, if you go up to the common road and you keep on going, that's where Ballyutoga is. Uh, and again, this is the remnants of the um, Marcus Gallery here. You can see it's much shorter than the other one. And then you can actually see the firing points here that goes back in 100 um, yard increments. I think it goes back to about 300 yards. Um, and how we know the Americans were here is that all their bullets, like the last time, are still there. But this time it was an easier walk for me. So I could actually go digging. Because, uh, like I said, because it's also heavily poisoned with lead and copper, nothing really grows apart from the hard, sturdiest grass. So you could pick out the, um, some of the bullets that are in there and have an examination through them. and. These particular bullets are typical American ammunition, which isn't the same as British. British had 303. The Americans had 30 odd six. Uh, and here we have uh, four examples of um, M2 ball. Um, this is M2 ball, and the, the one here is slightly longer is M2 uh, armor piercing, slightly longer than the other ones. But uh, taking calipers to them, like any good archaeologist does, um, since you're going to be 30 odd six and not 303. So what we can see is 
the Americans leaving their remains behind. Okay, the quartermaster depots. Not exactly the sexiest part of the whole show. It's not the infantry, it's not anything else, but the infantry and everyone else needs blankets, food, new shoes, spare parts, everything that keeps an army in the field. That's what you need quartermasters for. And these quartermaster depots were sighted all across the Northern Ireland. Um, was the best, one of the best examples still surviving, I found, much to my surprise, I didn't know it existed before I started doing survey work, was is the one just north of uh, Money Moor. And this is an aerial photograph of the site. Uh, this is uh, General Depot G10 stroke one. Uh, and you can see here, this each one of these is a double uh, Aris hut. So that's two huts, that's two huts, that's two huts. And it's all the way along. And each footing was another two huts. So you can guess this is actually quite a large depot. Uh, and then this line that runs across the road marks the spur line. So this is actually tied into the railway network. Uh, obviously, the spur line is long gone. And uh, this area down here is uh, it's used for footings. The, the handy thing about the concrete that they poured is that it was all so thick and so well done, is that when they wanted to rebuild them, they just rebuilt straight onto the concrete. And in this case, it actually is a lot of chicken sheds. Um, but these ones up here are just used for uh, you know, like agricultural storage. Uh, and there's still one, two, three, there's still six of these in a line. Still, if you actually go on the road north of Money Moor and you look aside and you see these big um, semicircular huts, that's what they are. That's the remnants of World War II. So, but other ones just vanish. Uh, this one I didn't even know existed until I was looking at the area photographs in Peroni. And um, did I see an awful lot of area photographs in Peroni? Probably more than I should. Um, and this is one uh, up near Desert Martin. And you can see quite clearly here, there's a road that comes across. And these were Romney sheds. These, they look quite like our sheds, sheds, but slightly different construction. Uh, and this was General Depot G10-8. Uh, and you can see there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the large sheds, the access roads, um, and then administration buildings. And this is it now on the other side. There's absolutely nothing. The only way you can actually see it, and this, Aerial, oh, we'll go back here. This aerial photograph was taken on one of the really dry summers. So you can see a parch mark that runs across here, a mark in the grass. And that's the only thing that really gives it away. This, so it's actually quite remarkable to think that something that was so prominent in the landscape when it was built almost vanishes. But then the US Army Air Force in Northern Ireland, um, how can you, the, the, probably one of the greatest countries of sites relating to the US forces in Northern Ireland that still survive are, are the ones relating to the uh, airfields, uh, the US Army Air Force airfields. But the US Army Air Force got six. Um, they got Clontow, uh, Langford Lodge, Mulletmore, McGabry, Tomb, and Greencastle. Anyone ever heard of them? Mm. Yeah, because Mulletmore is the only one that sneaks through because most people haven't heard of it, or McGabry, people just think of the prison. But the, the Americans had these ones here. Langford Lodge technically wasn't, uh, most of them used for combat, the Americans called combat crew training, uh, uh, combat crew replacement centers, um, which is mostly just when crews came over, they were taught how to fly and taught how to do their job, but these were the places where they turned individuals into you know, crews where they worked together. Uh, Langford Lodge was quite different. It was um, uh, used by the Lockheed Overseas Corporations to um, fit out uh, and uh, modify aircraft and repair aircraft. Um, first one we'll look at is Clonto. Um, it's one of my favorite ones. It was one of the first ones I did in the survey. Um, does anyone know where Clonto is? Do you already know all these things? Um, there are new questions for you later on. Um, this one's out by Art Bow, out by Loch Ness. Um, uh, and it was home for the number four combat crew replacement center. And it operated B-17s and they had to train crews on B-24s, uh, which required the runways to be extended. Uh, and at one point, it had three and a half thousand U.S. personnel, but by November 1944, it reverted back to the RAF. Now, an awful lot of the fabric, like a lot of these places, has been removed after the war, but there's some distinct developments. Uh, for one thing, uh, this is the only site outside private ownership or outside a place like Alder Group that the entire circuit of the taxiways and runways still exists. A lot of time, farm now, truncate, take a bit away. You can actually take a bike and you it's a bit dodgy on one side. There's a truck park where they make concrete, so you need to watch yourself on a bike or you end up flattened. But it's the only one that has the perimeter track entirely intact in Northern Ireland. But there are some buildings uh, that, that, that really quite tell a tale. One of them that the reason you want to remember is uh, the control tower. 
uh, if you're using RAF nomenclature, it's a watch office. They can get quite well, quite uh, annoyed about that. But the Americans, they called it a, a watch up, uh, called it a, a control tower. Uh, and this is where flight operations out of the airfield would be run. Uh, they also have the operations block. This is where flight operations out of wing run if it'd be under attack. This is actually the more fortified uh, part of the control center. Uh, fortified in one way we can tell for starting to see this big thing here. It looks like a chimney. It's actually an air intake. And it was designed to actually draw air in above poison gas clouds to create overpressure inside the building and keep the poison gas out. But what really makes this distinctive for as a US site is this wee building here. Uh, uh, and anyone know what it is? Anyone got it? Northern Bomb site. Northern, yeah, I shouldn't ask. It's the Northern Bomb site store. Um, the Northern Bomb site store, the Northern Bomb site had a classification equal to the Manhattan Project and secrecy. Uh, it was so secret, it was like a, an analog computer you used it. Uh, when a bombardier had its target set, they would literally add the guidance of the plane over to this device that would steer the plane onto the target and make the minor, uh, the tiny adjustments. Um, it was hugely secret. And uh, they didn't actually share the Northern Bomb site even with the RAF, they kept it themselves. Um, and so whenever anyone was train finished training, with the Northern bomb site, it was their the bombardier job to actually take it off the plane and bring it into the Northern bomb site, and that's why you see we see the bars here. That's actually to keep the Northern bomb site secure. How are we doing for time? Good. Um, Langford Lodge. What's the several Langford Lodge? Langford Lodge. Northern Ireland also the, um, one of the largest U.S. Army Air Force depot, depots in the U.K. at Langford Lodge. Now it's sitting on the southeastern shore of Loch Ness. The Base or depot was used by the Lockheed Overseas Corporation and the US Army Air Force to repair aircraft for delivery of the operational units. Now, battle damaged aircraft were also repaired and aircraft engines were stored and rebuilt. And in the 18 months between November 1942 and April 44, some 3,800 3, aircraft were assembled or modified here and repaired, while another 11,000 were serviced. And this came to an end in August 1944. But the aircraft, considered, uh, the airfield continued to be used for aircraft storage. You can see that's on the the finger parts, something called snowflake dispersals, where they have high density. You would never got away with this early in the war when, when there was a threat of air attack. But later in the war, they have no problem with high density storage. Now, the, air, the airfield actually survives this, this very day. It's actually um, used by a subsidiary of Martin Baker Company, that's the people who make ejector sheets. Uh, and so the runways and many of the buildings survive in, in good condition. Now, I would show you photographs of what all these buildings are, but I can't under agreement with the people. They let me do the survey, but um, they requested that I didn't put the uh, photographs of the, the main buildings out in the public um, uh, east just, uh, uh, on public just yet, so I can't show them. But I can show you a couple of things. Um, and here we have the uh, control tower, which is actually quite uh, unique of its type in Northern Ireland. It's uh, the only one in Northern Ireland has uh, inward sloping windows, which is apparently something to do with reflection or operating under night conditions. I think it's something to do with the, the way that it reflects the light. Um, or they, they put slim sloping windows in with the torrid as well. They, every window window there's a slope. Um, and also one of the things that came as a surprise to me is uh, surviving in the landscape to see these, uh, uh, the finger parts, the snowflake dispersals. Now this, um, normally you wouldn't see this uh, on, on a normal aerial photograph because this is all grassed over. And I actually went around the top of the, all the different landowners and they said, well, actually what happened is at the end of the war, when they got the land back, there was so much concrete poured that they didn't have the resources to lift all the concrete. So they just grassed over it. So literally what you're seeing there is the whole network of um, uh, dispersals actually still surviving under the ground. Still there, yeah, this is all still there. Okay. Also, you have the... Um, uh, the domestic sites, the living sites of the workers, the, the Lockheed workers that were there, who were not soldiers, they were civilians. And so they actually got quite salubrious surroundings compared to the old Nissen huts. And here we have here is a photograph of the one of the hutted sites for the Lockheed overseas workers. And here you see is see the ablution block. And then here's what I'm reliably informed is a casualty stroke air raid shelter for casualty station stroke air raid shelter for um the staff should she lying for logic come under attack. And believe it or not, this is the exact same one that you see in the photograph. See here, the, all the features are still there and the gaps, see the, the um, lying sheds, the, the prefabricated sheds are gone, leaving only the footings. But uh, this here is the ablution block. 
it's where they would have went in and would have had the showers and shaves and all the rest of that. Uh, and of course, this is what remains still. And there's actually there's quite a large amount of the um, uh, ablution blocks in the, the more sturdier buildings actually remain all across the, the landscape there for a lot of the, the hotted sites. Even though I think about two of them are, are still under the ownership, I think Randox actually might have them. Hobbit and Mullet Moor was another one. Um, where are we here? Um, Mullet Moor was home to the sixth replacement training squadron from the end of November 1943 until February 44, when the station was closed. Uh, uh, and it was used for short term storage for um, referred to the RAF control in May 1944. Now it has all the familiar buildings, uh, such as the tower. These are the, the cannon. No, this is, uh, uh, it's not the cannon, but it's actually it's the 25 yard range, no for um, uh, shooting range. Uh, this odd looking building is the parachute store. Parachutes, if you actually kept them wrapped, actually have condensation. And if you have condensation in parachutes, then you actually get mold. And if you get mold, you get holes. And guess what happens? You get holes in your parachute and you start to use it exactly. So you had this odd shaped building that you actually hung your parachutes from that would dry them out. Uh, then you had actually the explosives areas there, which funnily enough, you might understand that the explosive stores are kept away from the main sites uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and this is the bomb stores up at more. You can see each, uh, they see the ramp here for loading the explode the bombs into the store. And then you had a lower level. So use gravity to let it out. As you would have loaded the gravity, then you were taking that from a lower level out the other side. Um, and I think it's, there's four sections there. Uh, four areas where you had, would have had the explosives, the bombs actually stored in the open, they weren't, stored, they weren't uh, closed in. But there's a road actually comes down from here, and this is the road that travels from those stores. And you have two sheds here, which are the fusion sheds. Uh, and, and how these work is that see how doors at either end. Then he's actually seen any of the shows where you see like uh, the bombers getting armed, you know, like a trolley train, like big sausage links of what you would have been is drive in that shed, and you had the armor would have fused each bomb and then drove on out. The, the arm the aircraft. Why, why did they have bombs stored if they weren't operational basically? Because they did actually end up, they did, it was the live fire training uh, out over a lot of seeds. Um, or is they, um, this is actually a question I asked myself, like why, why would they have the explosive store? But yeah, because they were fully operational training, eventually they had to go to live fire and had to use live ordnance. Right. I had synthetic training, um, what we would call simulators now. Um, the one on the left is an ML bombing teacher, which teaches bombardiers how to drop bombs. Um, the other one here is a link trainer, which teaches uh, pilots how to fly on instruments. And this is um, a turret trainer that teaches uh, aerial gunners how to shoot. Um, this is in the ML bomber here, the bomb trainer here, which is like a projector, projected um, a dot on the map. Uh, or project, uh, projected, uh, sorry, uh, a map on the screen, and then through actually busy like smoke and mirrors, it's like an amazing thing that a bombardier could work with a pilot uh, to actually have a simulated bomb drop. So they could basically practice using bomb sites without actually leaving the ground. Uh, here we have a link trainer, which is as you see that closes over, so you have a pilot operating in complete darkness, but simulating how to fly an aircraft using just uh, instruments. And here you have uh, a turret trainer. Would have like a large curved screen and you had a target projected against that. And of course, you would have simulated gunfire using lights and noise. And then an instructor would have told you how well, you know, how much you had to lead an aircraft when you were shooting at it. And so you, you had an instructor. With. So it's all basically how to teach people how to do things without actually leaving the ground. It's a lot cheaper that way. Now we're coming on to Green Castle. All right. Greencastle actually one of the largest air fields handed over to the, uh, the US Air Force. Um, it was handed over in August 1943, sorry, when it became a combat group placement center. The first units arriving in uh, uh, later that month. Uh, it specialized in training gunners for B-24s, but it was also a satellite depot for Langford Lodge, uh, modifying uh, B-17s before dispatched to combat units. And by February 1944, there was nearly 570 aircraft that had been processed through Greencastle. Now, the training continued into uh, 1944, but after the day, the uh, site was readily stunned, but steadily run down with training coming in end by September. Uh, it became a site for storage of surplus air and war rear aircraft with a 1.320 stored on site. Um, but as I like I said, it's also used for a site for training gunners. 
Uh, and here you can see a contemporary shot of uh, Gunners, uh, a Greencastle airfield being trained how to use the M2 50 caliber machine gun, which is the standard machine gun for uh, bomber defense uh, used by the US Army Air Force. And you see here they're mounted on concrete plinths. And when you go to Greencastle today, you can still find these concrete plinths buried inside the walls. See that there? And just uh, uh, on stuck into it is the metal mount that the uh, machine gun would be mounted on. So again, you can see evidence, not just of the buildings, but also the training buried in the landscape, but it can be tricky to spot it. You just need to know what you're looking for. Now, the involvement of the Americans in some of the places where they went wasn't exactly, uh, they, that wasn't all uh, fun and games. There were some high-handed approaches taken with the locals about where they were going to develop and who had to move out of their houses. Uh, and certainly down in Green Castle and I've seen other places like Tomb, there is, the Americans are not as fondly remembered as you think. Um, so is this a reason why um, whenever the chance came uh, after the Americans left, I think, the airfield remained till about 1960, but then uh, they started uh, to reclaim the land. I think there's a lot of sand and gravel extraction down there. Um, but if you go down there now and even look at the air photographs, the air photographs almost totally remain. You will find very little, you have to say that there, you'll find some buildings, you know what you're looking at, but the actual runways themselves and the taxiways are almost entirely removed. Um, but like I say, if you need to know what you're looking at, um, it's a lot mostly in the wall and see all this. It's not dry stone walls, it's dry concrete walls. And it's where they've broken up all the concrete and created a whole, and there's miles of these things, um, all made of broken up concrete, broken up brick, uh, all throughout the area. Uh, but you could drive through it and not notice it. But yeah, that's where the, where the runways and the taxiways are. Now, this is actually some items we've recently come, been had them into the museum. Um, and why we have this is even though the sites were there and the training they went on. Um, I think uh, there was something like 3,000 off airfield crashes of aircraft during uh, the Second World War. And one of these um, was a B-17 that crashed into the Cape Hill uh, in Belfast on the 1st of June, um, uh, 1944. Uh, and a good friend of ours, uh, Alfie, has donated these to the museum. Uh, one of them is, these are aerial gunners wings. And all 10 crew were killed and five of those crew would have been aerial gunners. And this is one of the badges that he would have been worn or it would have been in their kit because they were transferring from America at the time. Uh, and th this would have been one of their aerial gunners wings. This is uh, carbonized because the, the plane caught fire. Uh, this is an Abisco biscuit. That is the, you can't actually quite read it, but it says Abisco. Uh, it's an Abisco, but it's part of the K rations that would have been the food that they would have had on board to eat. Um, this is a 50 caliber shell that uh, 50 calibers, like I say, was a standard armament of uh, B-17s at the time. It was B-17G, I think it was. Um, but in the fire, the ammunition cooked off. And of course, you can see here the typical uh, condition. This is actually what happens when the ammunition cooks off. And this is one of the 50 caliber slugs. Uh, there was also um, just sitting on the surface. You didn't have to dig for these because, again, because of an aluminium fire, a lot of it actually contaminated ground. It won't grow. So the surface remains sort of quite loamy. And every time it rains, it's sort of a wee bit important more up here. And he gives a couple of types of those. There's the standard boat tail, which is you no know, your, your your solid slug, and then there's another one which is hollow at the back. Do anyone know for it? You know what you nod your head. Do you know what the hollow the hollow at the back of the boat's for? I do, but I can't remember. Go ahead. Tracer. Tracer. One five of those five uh, five to eight hundred rounds per minute, and one five of those bullets was a tracer, so that the uh, gunner could actually see the where the fall of his bullets was. Now we're getting on to the graffiti. That young men being away from home just can't keep their hands themselves. Um, everyone knows it. You know what they're like. Uh, uh, and in this case, it's graffiti. They, wherever they go, they write on everything. In this case, it can be quite artistic. This is one from the Augury in County Armagh. It was home to the 654 Tank Destroyer Battalion. Uh, and you can guess why they have that image. Um, as a tank destroyer, they've got this panther crunching on a tank. It's all very artistic. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, and the other one, uh, you can see New York. It was actually um, in you know, the uh, Port Moon, no, the, sorry, the Dunseverick anti-tank range. Well, inside the, the range blockhouses, not in the blockhouse itself, that was the strange thing, but on the porch, obviously where someone standing waiting and they were bored and just decided they're going to carve the names. Uh, and they had carved, and it was New York and then Brooklyn, and then there's other names and there's American ones and there's uh, in, um, British units. 
all carved in these walls. I just keep, keep their hands from those. Now, this is the ones you were talking about um, on the steel walls up in the Armco sheds in Fincarn. Um, and that one, I haven't, I haven't got Hitler, but I don't have them handy. This one could be Hitler. Um, it's hard to see. They generally have a thing. They have Hitler. They have Churchill. Churchill. They have bulldogs. They have women. They have lots of women. And then after they draw women, they draw a few more women. I think the photograph of the normal, it's definitely Hitler. Oh, no, no. There's one actually has a wee moustache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and they, they drew a lot of women. This, uh, again, is one of the Armco sheds up in Fincarn. This one is... Uh, Someone might have cleaned up by gouging the holes in it. Um, at uh, Killy Moon Lodge, where, like I said, that was the 505th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment, um, was stationed there. Uh, and yeah, it, it's that it, my as my mother would say, it was pure filth. Um, but sure, boys, well, well, it's probably the first time they're away from home. Uh, but also, the as much as all fun games, sometimes some poignant things like this one's also, um, uh, in Killy Moon. Uh, and this was uh, Private Tony Vickery, and he's the HQ Company 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Now, anything I'm going to say about this was research was done by Andy Glenn for World War II, and I, he's the one that followed this up, so I'm only repeating what he studied. Um, and again, this is one of many names that were um, carved in the wall uh, at Killy Moon. And these are all young men going off the war, and so they make their mark. Uh, so Private Tony Vickery, I think he becomes a tech sergeant. Uh, um, he's, he's suddenly promoted before, um, and he makes the jump with the 82nd Airborne in the Normandy on D Day. Um, uh, but unfortunately, it's on, um, I think he makes it a D plus five. Uh, I think Andy found out that he was doing guard patrol, uh, guard for his unit while they were catching some rest. He was manning the machine gun, and a German patrol came in. And the story is that he waited until they got as close as possible and ended up with fire. But in the firefight, he's then found dead. He'd been shot through the throat. So one of the things quite poignant about these things is that even though we're talking about these places and bricks and runways, what's most important always to remember, these were people who were, these are here because people ended up being uprooted from their lives. Tony Vickery, I'm sure, didn't want to be here. All these names of other people didn't want to be here. And it's always very important to remember that why you remember these things, remember that there was people that were here and people's lives that were either lost in the case of tragedy um, uh, Tony Vickery's or just um, uprooted for loved ones for years at a time. One of the things I noticed after joining here was that we were looking at diaries or notes that they were writing their letters and they're not writing to their, um, they're not writing in their diary about um, great events that history records. Um, I one I came across, he was serving in uh, Burma and he gets to the sixth or seven, it, it's no, the, when Hiroshima gets the atomic bomb, he writes, oh, someone says a place called Hiroshima was destroyed, and then continues writing what he says. It doesn't really have any import. What actually comes through is how lonely he is and how much he wants to get back to his wife. And that's what's important always to remember when we're doing these things, that it's people and people's stories. And that's where yeah, I find it, if people actually bring these stories in, yes, it helps complement the things we know about it and actually has far more context and far more gets quite here sometimes. So, and that's what makes doing this job really worthwhile. Okay, enough of the depressing stuff. We'll come to the end now. Um, but it'll be remiss if you actually sat through one of them and either you'll run out screaming and say, right, that's enough of that crack. Or we've got a few more coming up on the 2nd of November. We've got Michael Burns uh, from Northern Ireland War Memorial and he'll be doing Honouring the Dead and Serving the Living. And it's a history of the Northern Ireland War Memorial and how it got set up and why it got set up and how it came into being. Uh, and then after that, we've got the 30th of November, John A. E. And he'll be doing second, but he's long been well known, Northern Ireland, this guy who does uh, recology, he does uh, aviation archaeology. He, uh, people, he was on TV doing the recovery of Bud Wolf's Spitfire up in Donegal. He'll be having a chat about that. Johnny's mighty crack, uh, and he'll be on the 30th of November. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Any, or is all stunned in yeah. the sense? Um, the uh, McGee, that book you were talking about, uh, is, is reputed to be there. Yeah. Surely there's evidence, you know, surely there's like record to say whether it's there or not. 
there is i have seen uh mark lesby has worked with base one up there and he showed me some you no know, the, the map you no know, the, the the schematic maps of what was developed there yeah but they're only um you know uh schematic maps there's no sections so it doesn't say how many floors there are and like that i think what muddies the water he's uh, he's one of the ones that remember he said no it's an administration block and that's all it is there's other stories that came up I think through the 90s, I remember there's a woman that was a Wren and she published in one of the local papers up there and she said she descended this, this bunker and it's actually under the garden. Other people say it's not. Other people say it was the shelter that was built beside Talbot House that got, yeah. no Talbot House, Talbot House got demolished to put in the, that's right. It's like the student union up there or something like that. Like that. Uh, no, there, there was, I've never seen a documentary on YouTube and it was like a two part thing, but they only ever made the show the first part. And I can't remember who did it or who, who was involved, but they were they were going around that big grass area in front of the gate and poking things in. I mean, then we were talking about bringing a ground penetrating radar in, and they said then they said right, this will be in part two, or, or not ground penetrating. Yeah, ground oh penetrating. yeah, you're right. You know, and um, but part two never appeared anymore. Um, it's one of those things. Do you really want to know? Is it a two? Is it better as a story? Uh, part of me says yeah, I'd love to know. Part of me says I don't know. I come from an archaeology world where if you do geophysics and you get a fantastic plot, one of the things they say is it never ruin your no, never ruin it by actually digging it because you might just find out that there's nothing there. There's nothing there, yeah. Well, I, like <laughs> I know, I'd like to know though. Anyway, yeah. It has to be somewhere. If it exists, it has to be yeah. somewhere, yeah. yeah. Was it subsurface? Was it just strengthened? I don't know. Well, I mean, it was a major, I guess. So like, it was, it absolutely was. Like, don't get me wrong, yeah. yeah it was yeah. a. It would make sense that they would have had some sort of something that was, you know, impenetrable. Yeah, it makes me want to. If they fortified everything else, yeah. why would you not strengthen at least your command control center? The, the one thing you could at least afford to have blown to pieces. Yeah. Um, But I don't know. I don't know enough about it to actually say one way or the other. The archaeologist me says, I get a get a spade in the ground, we'll find out. But I don't think there's the money or resources for that just yet. Though it would be interesting. One of these days. One of these days. I, I've been saying one of these days for 20 years, so I'm not getting anyone else. Come on, someone's got a question. What's the biggest like um people obviously the Americans came over, I think they were obviously resentful of them coming in and he's intrigued by Gosford. Um, because it's obviously it was privately owned and there was I think there was a family actually living there at the time because my grand was actually from there. Mm. Yeah, so like every weekend they would invite like a lot of like her children mm. over there to like obviously enjoy their big gardens and everything they are. And like obviously did they like them being there or is there any money you've got to speak to in Gosford? I've never actually managed to get tapped in on Gosford. Unfortunately, when I was doing my work, it was from an archaeological angle. So they had me chasing bits and things. Uh, and only as uh afterthought could I no, I just talked to everyone I could, but that we were very clear that's not what I was there for. Um I would be loved to find out. Don't get me wrong, there was some bitterness with some places in America. Other places loved them because they brought loads of things, they brought employment. Everyone was getting loaded out. There was up in Tanto. Um, one of the stories that they people were just getting so rich. One of the stories they told is that um, when you were bringing in material, hardcore or something like that, no built material, you got paid by the load. And so as you went in and you got paid, you got given a chip and you were paid, and then they just drove it by the back gate and, fed <laughs> it and then brought it back in again. One of the, one of the old stories is the uh, one that the guy says he, he ended up caught on because there's moss growing on the top of it. <laughs> But but there's truth to the fact that they were this is Conto again, but I've seen it replicated in other airfields. Is that oh, I'm moving away from camera here? Um, I've seen it replicated in other stories. Is that like another you know, big dispersal pads and the like little group of frame pans uh, where you park planes on it? They only had to be about six inches thick, but then people when they went left them found that they were nine inches and twelve inches thick because people were getting paid by the concrete load. Just gonna keep it. Go on, lads. Go on, and you just go. And so something that it was everything was built you know, twice as heavy and quite as thing. So there's a lot of people like where the Americans were. A lot of the Americans were actually uh, certainly on the Red Cross things. They they uh, sponsored uh, orphan children and that sort of thing. So yes, while there was land difficulties and localized issues, uh, and sometimes they didn't mix as well with you no know, depending on the unit, depending on what they were being trained with. And other places, 
definitely there was a lot of fraternization. Certainly, it's like 1,400, 1,500 women ended up marrying to you guys. So there's plenty of fraternization going on. My aunt got engaged to three of them. They were married to any of them, don't they? <laughs> um, <laughs> she did, but she definitely had one anyway. Um, but yeah, so they, they definitely did enjoy having the emergency as well because remember, Barson didn't. They 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 brought it all with them. Um, so if you wanted something, or you needed to get that was you can get it right. And like the Americans were, um, and certainly we have oral histories that have come in from places like um, Castle Well, uh, and the stories from the ladies that were um, I remember I can't remember her name, but she was a kid. When the Americans were there, and she remembers two Americans, three Americans coming into their house, and their mum would have made them dinner, and they would have brought things that couldn't like bubble gum and all that sort of stuff, yeah. the things that they couldn't have. And so they really enjoyed having them. And then, then they all went off to whichever part of the war they went to. And I, I think she actually said they were in contact after the war. So there was a lot of um, friendships made as well. So, yes, don't get me wrong, while there was some places, there was a lot of really positive feeling on other sides as well. Guidance book that they got telling them not to. They're very well, that's yeah. exactly that one there, the, the handbook, the guidebook. Like, don't feel the ordinance for everybody. If you're invited out for tea, don't eat everything they have because they've got you know, rationing and all that's that exactly. sort of stuff. So don't talk about politics or religion. Yeah. Um, they also said, and if you're talking to the girls and you talk back to you, don't be thinking you're in there just because they're talking back to you. They're just being polite. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like, it actually an excellent book. Um, the it's sitting there in the cabinet. Yeah. Um, and it's really tongue in cheek. Yeah. It's really written with humor. Um, uh, so yeah, it's an, a lot of the other ones don't be a bit more staid and go, well, you can go to Belfast and see these sites. But this one is, is really quite funny, actually. It's that paper definitely had a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, and and you see some of their later stuff that they published by the troops themselves. And mostly you can actually tell what's in their minds is uh women in the weather. Oh it's, it's they hate the weather. They, they hate the weather. Everything's, everything's wet. wet. Yeah. Uh women and inter-service rivalry. That's pretty much it. We bit about the border because I think they were stressing very much to the Americans like don't cross the border. They did. There are lots of that going on anyway. Um but yeah you can actually read in their cartoons what's what's important to them. Yeah and that has like I don't think baseball games, but there's um, was in Carrick, I think. Oh, yeah. The first sort of baseball games. Yeah, the baseball games, um, later American football games. Yeah. There's actually, there's a thing in the cabinet just behind the post there. It's one of the first baseball games they had, was, I think it was in Ravenhill. Yeah. Uh, and all the spectators. But as on one side of the pamphlet, it's like, no, what the game is. But on the other side, it was actually the rules. Yeah. Because most people didn't know. No, <laughs> like baseball. Right. So they had the rules in the back so that people could keep yeah. up with what's going on. And the weird thing it was about these Americans is that um, as much as they appeared all of a sudden, whenever they went, it could be almost overnight. Yeah. Because this is like the first armor and third or then third or just shipped out straight away. And obviously they couldn't say where they were going. Yeah. So just one minute to have these camps full of thousands of men. And then they're kind of gone. So with that they have like personal relationships that disappear, but also people are getting you no know, quids in and all of a sudden like you're like, it's just shop because yeah. it's always that thing. <laughs> Huge. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Numbers of personnel. Yeah, ultimately, I think the peak at one point is 120, 130,000 at one point, which is ten percent of the population in Northern Ireland was Americans, um, and I think three hundred thousand overall. And we're not just talking about. Remember, you start adding to those the Canadians and the Belgians and everyone else, and then the British, uh, our British Army units that were here. There's an awful lot of it. It, it, it yeah. does get very crowded. Did anyone else? Was that... yeah. Oh! Sorry, it's one of my favorite books. Jasmine's in Mullen, Mullen Moore, another name for Act of the Week. Or... That's exactly what it is. Yeah, Mullen Moore, Act of the Week. Same thing. Um, great airfield, actually, loads still to see there. The problem is with airfields, and it's always has been here, is that even though I get sitting and show you fantastic photographs and rock on about how fantastic it is and how meaningful they are, they are largely on private land. Mm -hmm. um, and those some farmers who might be accommodated and some farmers might be not be accommodated. You have to remember that they are on private land and you can't just rock up and down to where you like. You have to ask permission. Are there any colored troops in Northern Ireland? You're honest. I haven't been in England and we're treated completely different to what they... They, 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 they certainly were um, uh, colored troops here. Largely, as part of members in the quartermaster units. Uh, a lot of the quartermaster units were uh, colored troops. As they called them, um, 
and they would of course the American army still had segregation and they tried to install it here as well um which was rejected in certain cases um then they sort of had a de facto sort of because there was trouble between uh white and black troops uh certainly there was a almost a race ride for it and it was Antrim. um so there was issues uh that they tried to smooth over they didn't I don't believe that they started uh they they um uh, accommodated segregation here but there was some certain unwritten rules certainly in the Near East or like you no know, black troops wouldn't be sort of on the east side of the canal after a certain time and that sort of thing just to try and smooth things over um but yeah I think actually there's still a an awful lot to learn about um race relations in Northern Ireland at, at the time certainly um th there's old stories about you no know, uh you had black troops coming over here and being amazed uh, I think one of the old stories is that uh, it was the first time I was ever called sir in a shop because obviously the um, black troops remain an oddity in Northern Ireland but you didn't have that sort of uh, racism that perhaps they were used to maybe in the United States and it was, it, it was um it became unexpected for them actually certainly they didn't comment upon it. 